um, one on the floor. Um, this is a fuzzy tail. The reason you have a tail is for drag, and it's supposed to help prevent the kite from moving in the sky. Like this one will sit up, and it's not, um, it'll stay in one spot, but it kind of wobbles as it flies, and so that's a little bit um, not desirable. And then, so that tail is supposed to help dampen that, that wobble. It kind of gives it some pull on the back, and then it's supposed to help stabilize it. Um, this one's not super well behaved. The delta, however, this is a nine foot levitation delta from into the wind. This one's really well behaved, but it can't lift nearly as much as the parafoil. Um, we've only put, um, we've put two GoPros on this one and we've flown small cameras with this. Um, so I would only put a couple pounds on this one just because it's um, a smaller kite. It doesn't lift as well, um, but you can get bigger deltas. Um, I think they make a 16 foot one as well, which is a little bit more expensive. So you can get a, a delta that would lift something really substantial, like an SLR, if you really wanted to. Um, but they're all pretty, so no one has any problems with them. Um, this picture that you can see of two people, one of them's Alex. Um, we're flying over a really populated beach in August. It's, this is in Malibu. Nobody asked us what the thing attached to the kite was. <laughs> nobody. So we, nobody cared. <laughs> If it was a drone, they would have cared, um, but not the kite, especially with a beach. Nobody thinks about the um, kites on a beach. So cameras, now that you've got your lifting device, you need to figure out what your sensors are. Um, you can put anything on these. You could you know, do an Arduino or whatever um, if you wanted to instead. Uh, we've been using cameras just because they're already set up. Ideally, to get started, I would recommend using something lightweight. I started trying to fly digital SLRs, big honking cameras. Uh, <laughs> That's definitely not the way to go. Uh, a GoPro is okay if you don't mind the fisheye distortion on the edges, um, or you can switch out the lenses on those, or um, one of the smaller point and shoots makes a really good sensor for this kind of system. Uh, but you can get as fancy as you want, as long as you've got a kite that can lift it, uh, you can put whatever heavy thing on it you like. Um, it's nice to have some kind of shutter timer or remote communication device. So we use uh, programs on the cameras um, called, uh, one of them is called CHDK or SDM. You can load up software onto the camera itself and program the timer on the camera, which is really nice. You can actually set up a, um, like a delay. So if you know it's gonna take a couple minutes to get the camera or the kite in the air, you can say, don't start taking pictures for like two or three minutes. And then once you start taking pictures, do it for every three seconds, take one shot every three seconds, and either do it until the card is full, or maybe I know I only want 100 shots, so I can say stop after 100. Usually we just fill the card, but um, you can tell it what you want. So um, there's also tools that you can use to remote, remotely communicate with you know, um, radio signals or whatever to your camera. I would recommend to get started, pick something inexpensive so that if it crashes, you don't have to s replace it as much. Um, you can always upgrade later. Like I said, we started on high end and that's probably not a great idea because there's a lot of worry involved with that. Um, CHDK and SDM are only Canon cameras. Yeah. GoPro has a built-in interval mode. Mm -hmm. uh, any other brand, you have to look up some other way to do it. Yeah. So you have, you have options and you, again, you don't have to even use a camera. We also use cameras that are modified to collect in infrared because I do plant research, so infrared is really important information to have. So you can actually take sensors out of the cameras and replace them with filters, or um, you can actually, there's companies that will modify it too if you don't feel up for taking parts out of cameras. But it's possible, and there's a lot of information online about how to do it if you want to do it yourself. Um, here's, here's our digital SLR pair. So the one with the red dot on the top takes pictures in infrared. There's uh, all of the filters are removed inside, and then we can put filters on the front of it so that we can decide if it takes pictures in color or in infrared or if it collects everything. And then the other one's just a normal camera. But you can see those are really heavy and not recommended. Um, how we get them on the, the kite itself, um, when I first started with kite aerial photography, I thought, oh, it attaches to the kite. It doesn't. It actually attaches to the line that's attached to the kite. Um, and the way that we do that is we have something called a peak event, and then we have, um, we put the camera inside this plastic trash can. Uh, super glamorous, right? Um, so um, the reason we have that is because the camera sits inside the bucket. 
and then the lens sits about this far down inside so that if this hits the ground, you're not dragging the camera lens, the glass through the dirt. Um, if this isn't meant for impact, if this fell, you know, 100 feet, it's all over, but it just keeps your lenses from getting scratched if there's a little thing to um, prevent it from dragging around in the dirt. Um, landings are not always graceful when you have a kite, so this is kind of helpful. And then um, we attach to the top this thing called a peak of it, so the bolts go all the way through the um, the bucket and then we tighten them down. And the nice thing is that um, this little contraption, if it doesn't matter what angle the kite line is flying at, whether it's really steep or really flat, it keeps the camera really level. It also dampens some of the swing. So if you get a really windy day that's gusty and it starts swinging back and forth, it dampens it a little bit. It's never going to keep it perfectly still, but it's really useful to have this anyway. Just You might as well take some of the swing out of it. And there's instructions online for how to make these and how to string them. <coughs> yeah, the, the line on there is just um, masonry twine. We have a bunch of that. Um, so yeah, the camera mounts inside this bucket, and it keeps it nice and safe. And then when you get the pictures out of it, um, this is an example over a beach in Santa Barbara. Uh, you can see the colored um, and the infrared pair of the two, um, two images. So the color one looks normal. It's your regular old picture that comes out of a... Um, camera and then the infrared one looks pink because um, it's recording on most of the infrared is recording on the red sensor of the camera um, and it's getting a lot more of the infrared than the other bands and so it's it looks pink so the red's getting triggered a lot more um, what we do is we separate them out so you don't need to really separate out red green and blue but you can see what it would look like if you did and then the gray one at the bottom is IR so you can stitch all of these together and make yourself a four-band image if you want, or five or twelve or whatever sensors you've got. Yeah. So, um, how do you actually attach them? Ah, that's an excellent question. So we use um, carabiners, and when you get the kite flying, um, you let it out a certain distance and let it get flying and get it nice and stable, and then you actually take the kite line, open up the carabiner, and you wrap it around the inside of the carabiner and close it. And that wrap, when it's under tension, will keep it actually in place. So you have two carabiners on the line um, just sitting there. And then when you take it down, you unclip the carabiner, unwind it, and pull it off. So it's a pretty, pretty quick, slick way to do it. We can show you in person, probably, um, if you want to come up and see how to do it. <laughs> it probably would be easier uh, close up. Uh, sorry, it's perplexing to explain in, on stage. How far away is that from the kite itself? Sorry, what? How far away is that? Um, it depends on the day and what the wind conditions are. You kind of just have to gauge it. Um, we usually five, ten feet, maybe yeah, more, than more than that. that. Yeah. It's so kind of got to be flying before it works. The two kites fly at different angles. Yeah. The delta flies at a much higher angle, so we can put that much closer to the kite. For the uh, parafoil one, we usually um, are further away, and so the mm -hmm. kite goes up higher and drifts out and pulls the camera up further. Yeah, so you kind of have to gauge it. The, the kite really needs to be stable flying before you attach this and then let out more line to have it go up. So, right, so we usually start the kite, get mm -hmm. it up flying, and when we think it's nice and stable, one of us will hold the line and the other person will go attach the camera, and then we'll let more line out to let it up. Yeah. What was the question? Twin and quad line kites. Um, we, we don't fly with those. We actually have a quad line um, stunt kite that we thought we would start with. Um, the extra lines actually get in the way and because at least our, um, our stunt kite is meant for movement, um, that's not ideal for the situation because it needs to constantly be moving. And when you do that, um, we, we set up a rig that really didn't work. We ended up with the peak event line wrapped around all the kite lines because it started flinging it around. <laughs> It was quite a disaster. So um, I reckon, yeah, it seems like our thought was more lines sounds way more stable and better, but it turns out one line is actually, for us, has worked best. Um, everyone I talked to really recommended not doing multiple line kites. So, and then we found out why. So <laughs> had to try it, right? Uh, um, so some of the other kite accessories. We talked about the camera housing um, and shutter timers, the peak of it. Um, you want to get a really nice substantial reel for these kinds of kites. Uh, I recommend just purchasing them. We tried to make our own, but eventually it fell apart. Um, we made it out of really substantial, nice hardwood, and it cracked and then broke. 
Um, especially the big kite, the parafoil pulls so hard, it actually pulled the reel apart. So the silver one there is actually for deep sea fishing. Um, and it's meant for like pulling up marlin and things like that. Um, so it, that's probably a good analogy for the big kite. It really does pull hard. So you want something that's not going to fall apart or break. Um, this little one works fine for the delta. Yeah, that one's okay. Um, also, uh, you, want, you want some really heavy duty gloves. You want nice leather gloves. Um, and the reason for that is you're working with a line under tension. So, you know, like Raji was talking about, like, you know, the rotors on his thing will cut you. Um, the line under tension will also cut you. So you want to be really careful about that. It's, um, it sounds silly to talk about kites being dangerous, but the line under tension, especially with the parafoil that can lift, you know, five pounds or more, um, that's some serious tension on that line. And it, if it did decide to swoop across, um, I've seen sites that weren't about decapitation risk. So be careful with that. You really do want a nice sturdy glove too, because if, that, if you're holding onto the line and it takes off out of your hand, it, it can give you, I have had rope burns from that kite. So you want to be careful with that. Um, so it's not all, all fun and games. It's not completely safe. You do want to be careful. Um, one of the things we make sure that we do too is um, whoever's flying the kite, any other extra people are standing behind them so that it's just nice and safe. Okay, other tail options. This looks funny, but this is serious. <laughs> this is actually a drogue tail. It just happens to be shaped like a fish or a windsock. Um, and so you can attach this to the kite to provide drag. Um, we have a less, <laughs> no. <laughs> we have a less fancy drogue tail that's just black. It's shaped kind of like a bucket with the two ends cut out. Um, but those are other tail options to look at. They, again, provide drag to keep your kite stable in the air. So photo stitching. I think I'm gonna let Alex talk a little bit about that. Apparently you can just leave it. Can't get the clip. Okay. All right, so photo stitching. You have a lot of options. Here's a short list of options of things that we have attempted or tried in various ways. And uh, you get varying qualities out. And depending on how many photos you have, some of these are more viable than others. And um, depending on where you fly and how you fly, it matters. Um, I'll leave this up for a little bit. Um, a few things to point out here. Most of the things are cross-platform. Uh, MapKnitter is actually an online tool. And uh, that one's nice uh, if you are flying in a location where you have buildings and roads because you actually just drag the corners of your image to match what is on the base imagery they bring in from other sources like Google. Uh, all of the other tools are just matching photo to photo, not matching to the real world to start with. So here's uh, some example output from the Santa Barbara site that we were discussing earlier. This was done in Hugin uh, with some editing of the automated control points to make them better. Uh, if you use Hugin, you want to use the advanced mode, which they've hidden in recent versions, because you have much more control over the control points, and you can actually go in and fiddle and make sure that your image pairs have good matches between them. This is the same site recently done with Open Drone Map, which is uh, a very recent project and um, still early in development. And this one, uh, you just give it the stack of photos, and it does its thing. And uh, if you wanted to go back and fix things by hand, I'm not sure you even can with this. But it does a pretty good job. And uh, the other interesting aspect of this one is um, this is actually a snapshot from a 3D image. So Open Drone Map does 3D stitching, and uh, you should be able to get a point cloud out of it if you wanted to. So you, um, you can open it up in a 3D program and actually turn it on its side and look at the elevation change. Uh, here's another example from... Oh, this is Leo Carrillo State Park, so this is Southern California, kind of near LA. So this was a Hugin run one, and this is an open drone map one. Uh, the 3D modeling is why the lifeguard tower looks a little strange, because we didn't have photos from some sides. <laughs> this is just a zoom in of... No, this is Pacifica. Oh, so okay. This is actually the beach that's really close to here. Um, we just threw in some photo samples. Um, I don't think we have this one in Open 
map yet. Was the Leo Carrillo the G9? No, the Leo Carrillo, I think, was the SLR. OK, so all the photos I've shown you so far were all taken with a <laughs> Canon Rebel, a uh, digital Rebel. That's dog pee. She made me know. I just really washed out. Right, so uh, one of the nice things about Hugin is it does uh, blending of your uh, exposures. Uh, we actually often take bracketed photo exposures, so uh, most cameras have an, the ability to alternate between uh, slightly underexposed, slightly overexposed, and regular exposure. That way you, you can ensure that even if you didn't pick the right shutter speed, which fast shutter speeds are always better for this because you're moving, um, that you'll definitely get something and it probably won't be blurred. And you'll have at least some good exposure. And uh, we were talking yesterday actually about trying to do HDR stitching too. All right, so these are resources for you to look up to find more information about what other people are doing, to buy kites. Uh, we got some of our cameras from Max Max, um, their professional shop, and they actually, for at least the Rebel, they have um, calibration uh, graphs. So you can know how sensitive the sensor is to different bands when they remove filters. I'll make sure these get online. some links there too for um, how to download Hugin and Open Pro Map. Um, the rest of them I think are, are on the slide with all the options I think you probably already are familiar with. Um, yeah, yeah. So questions, comments, concerns? How difficult or how long would you take to actually make the air you do? Because with these guys you cannot really control too much where you're going, right? It's like more of Yeah, so it's I kind of um, think of it more like it's a stubborn dog, like you're taking it for a walk and it doesn't want to go. So you kind of have to like pull the line and drag it um, where you're going. It, it's, it, it really is hard to pull because like this one lifts a lot of weight, so it, it doesn't want to come with you. So you are just like dragging it as you go, and so you kind of have to aim it over the things you want. It's definitely not like Raji's drone where it's like goes exactly where you want it to go. You have to, you have to position it with the line so you're pulling it. Um, it actually depends more on the wind conditions than the kite itself, um, how easy it is to move it. Yeah. So you're kind of at the mercy of the weather. Yeah, so we usually start at one end of our site, and we pick, depending on which way the wind's going, to walk so that the uh, wind is blowing into the kite all the time, so we walk against the wind. And so we'll start at one end, and we'll just walk to the other end. And if we had a more non-linear area, like a square or something, then we would probably do some mission planning to decide how we're going to, a pattern we're going to walk. Because the kite will just shift with you as you, as you move, because mm -hmm. the wind just keeps pulling. Yeah? How big is the team that you're able to collect in one, I guess, one round of photography? Yeah, the limiting factor on this, um, is because you don't need any power sources to fly the actual kite, it, you know, the wind is providing that. Um, our limiting factor tends to be a, the size of the um, SD card in the cameras. So um, it really depends how many photos you're taking, how quickly you're taking them. Uh, but we've done, some of those scenes are probably, I think, 100 meters long. Uh, so and we didn't, we, I think on some of those we didn't fill the card, or you can get actually bigger cards than we have. So you could collect quite a bit of data with this. Uh, you can probably fly for several hours, if yeah. not more, depending on how often you want photos taken. Right. Yeah, so it's not like the drones where you've got like 20 minutes. This, as, long as, you're, as long as your arms can hold out holding these kites, it's between that and the, and the SD card. So if you've got a really big storage capacity, then you could fly longer. Yeah. What's the least amount of wind that you guys were able to fly in? Did you ever like have to like run really fast or drive in a car? And yeah. Yeah, so with the, um, before we got, the Delta is actually better in low wind conditions. It will fly at like three. Oh. Yeah, it's rated to yeah, three, miles three miles an hour. hour. So that one, that one will launch itself. You have to keep a foot on it and on a beach because otherwise it won't launch. Um, so it, it's willing to fly no matter what, pretty much. Um, but with the bigger one before we got the Delta, we had to sometimes run with it um, to get it up to a space where the, Sometimes the wind is blowing harder up at altitude than it is on the ground. So sometimes if you can hit that airspace, then it'll stay up. But So the yeah. trick with the 
heavier kites is you let out 100 feet of line first, and then you start slowly walking while someone hoists it up, and the slow walking will generate enough lift for you to get it up higher where there's more wind. Yeah. But the Delta is rated 3 to 20 miles an hour. The parafoil is 5 to 30 miles an hour. And it could probably do more than 30, but I wouldn't want to hold it in yeah. more than 30. It's, it pulls. Like, you have to lean into the, the line. Did it ever lift you up off the ground? There's been, yeah, there's been some times where um, most of the time with the, um, the reel, you have to brace it against your body. And so what will happen is you're holding on the top really hard, and then the bottom will flip out. So you, want, you have to really keep a good grip on it when it's really heavy wind. Uh, it's definitely not for children. You know, this is, this is not a kid's kite for sure. This is definitely an adult. And again, you don't want to fly these by yourself. You never want to fly a kite like this by yourself because you can get stuck with it. You never want to attach it to your body. Um, some people have, I've read horror stories online of people getting stuck flying kites because they didn't have anyone to come help. Um, and the, um, the parafoil, you can't bring down with one person. It requires two. So uh, definitely a two to three person team on these. Back sure. there. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Too many people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was curious, you know, with one going out at an angle, is it difficult at first to figure out where the camera is pointing? And um, is that something that you get better quickly at estimating? And also to cover certain areas where, you know, say if you're especially up against water, you don't want to mm -hmm. run in the water with a kite. Uh -huh. um, do you find yourself, is it difficult to bring the kite lower or higher to get further out? Yeah, uh, you get, a lot of times for us, we think that we covered space closer to us and is actually taking pictures further away. So we've learned to kind of maneuver and cover more area than we think we're actually covering because in the end it's always smaller than you think it's going to be. Um, but you can actually get it to lift up and come closer if you reel in line. So if you were up against like the water and you didn't want to, I wouldn't want to stand like in the ocean doing this. So um, if you reeled in line really quick it would actually lift up and come closer to you before it settled back down. So. Um, yeah, you can manipulate it that way. You also can just fly higher. Yeah. So you still have the same 400 foot ceiling limit. Uh, I don't think we ever actually get to that. Uh, we have 500 feet of line on our big reel, and we've never let all of it out. And if, since it flies at an angle, it's obviously not even. It's you know, it's not even going to hit 400 even at the angle. Uh, so fly higher and fly with a wider angle lens. But um, the Delta actually flies at almost 90 degrees, so that it's almost right overhead when you're flying it. Um, so that's nice, because then it's closer. The other one flies at a lower angle. So Which is good if you need to fly it over stuff you can't yes. actually stand near. Yeah, so if you wanted to fly over like a low fence, you could do that with the, the bigger kite. Uh, yeah, that's always the question. What's the grand resolution? Uh, this guy. Did you write it down? Um, I think I remember. Come on. Almost there. This one, um, this one we flew pretty low. This was actually flown with a hot air balloon, but um, same deal. Miniature. Yeah, miniature hot, hot air, air balloon. balloon. Miniature, it's like 15 feet high. Um, but this one has, I think, five centimeter pixels. So this is really, really high resolution, which is why it's really fun in open drone map, because it makes a really nice 3D scene. Um, so, but if you flew higher, you could get you know, bigger pixels, cover more area. Um, but obviously, we're trying to get beach plants and trying to look at that relationship. But um, you could fly higher and get um, less, uh, less tiny pixels. Yeah, knowing your field of view of your camera, yeah. you could estimate what height you want to fly at yeah. to get a certain resolution you're pretty much guaranteed sub-meter pixels. With yeah. any camera that's 10 megapixels or higher, it, mm -hmm. there's, it's almost impossible to get anything worse than that. Yeah. But it's usually closer to centimeter. Yeah, and you're also, remember, you are restricted by FAA regulations, so you can't fly above 400 feet, and you should stay away from airports. So, like, don't fly it here, because uh, we're right next to the landing strip. So. Right, I think Mapbox has a good map of where not to fly drones. Use that to where not to fly kites. Yeah, um, you don't want to fly this by an airplane. <laughs> uh, for us, because of because we're dealing with uh, it's for research for ecological stuff. Mostly, we're looking for nadir shots, so straight down. But um, that being said, when it's windy, the camera starts swinging, and so you do get some oblique shots. 
but you could set up your, if you wanted to do oblique stuff, you could just set up your camera rig, um, your peak of it and the camera holder to hold the camera at a different angle. So if you wanted to do that, you totally can. Open drone map software, which you should go see Steven's talk this afternoon, handles obliques. The camera can be at any angle. We have not, we have the capability right now, we just haven't flown that equipment. Um, in this image, you can see there's um, some black squares. Those are actually targets for GPS. So this one actually you can geo-reference because we know the locations of those targets. And actually, if you go, uh, we contributed this data set to the open drone map um, training data. So um, there's actually documentation about what those GPS locations are. So if you're interested in this data set, um, you can grab it there and there's all of the GPS stuff. But we have not yet tried a GPS logger on the cameras, but now we have cameras that do. So This camera here actually has built-in GPS. Yeah, I've, I've already it. used it with Mapillary to do some test runs, uh, riding my bike around town, and it works pretty well. It's a Canon S100. Yeah, so you can incorporate that. So uh, our effective focal length on the Rebel, I believe, is 50 millimeter. We used a fixed 20, and then there's a crop factor, um, or a fixed 28 or something like that. Uh, so on an SLR, you want to use a fixed lens, you get better quality images. Uh, you don't really have as much control uh, with the other cameras. You can always focus at infinity, because you're always far enough away from the subject. Um, so we just use the widest on whatever the stock cameras are. So I think we're just about out of time. So um, thank you very much. And if you have questions or you want to see equipment, you can come up before we pack it up.